الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته welcome brothers and sisters to another installment of our series a commentary on the last 10 chapters of the Quran and we have reached chapter number 112 surah al-ikhlas and as always we like to begin with some background information about uh, the surah before entering to the commentary Regarding this surah, Surah Al-Ikhlas, it has one name by which it is known, and that is Surah Al-Ikhlas, which could be translated as, as the pristine purity. We're going to talk about what that means. This name is evidently Ijtihadi. It is a name which the surah was given after the period of revelation, after the period of the Prophet and his companions. Uh, there is some debate as to whether or not the surah is Makkiyah or Madaniyah. Uh, some of the scholars, like Ibn Mas'ud, Al-Hasan, Al-Basri, Atta, and Ikrima, and Jabir, they were of the opinion that it is Makkiya, while uh, other scholars like Ibn Abbas, Qatad, and al Bahak, they were of the opinion that it is Madaniya. As far as the virtue of the Surah Al Bukhari has collected on authority of Abu Sayyid Al Khudri, and Muslim has collected on authority of Abu Huraira, that the Prophet والسلام, he said, Walladi nafsi biyadi, innaha la ta'dilu thuluth al Quran. I swear by the one whose hand lies my soul, that it's equivalent to a third of the Quran. And there is some debate amongst the scholars, so the virtue of Surah Al-Ikhlas is that it is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an. But the scholars have differed about what exactly that means. What exactly is the Prophet saying when he says that Surah Al-Ikhlas is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an? Perhaps the best uh, interpretation of that hadith is the one that says that the, it is a third of the Qur'an in terms of the Qur'an's subject matter. That basically when Allah Prophet ﷺ is saying that Surah Al-Ikhlas is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an, he means in terms of the subject matter of the Qur'an as a whole. And the scholars who hold that opinion can be divided into two camps. The first one is Ibn Al-Qayyim Taala, as he mentioned in Bada'i Tafsir. Bada'i Tafsir. So he mentioned that the Qur'an, in terms of its subject matter, can be divided into three things. One, al-awama wa nawahi commands and prohibitions. Number two, al-khabar and illah information regarding Allah, like His names and His attributes. And number three, al-khabar and al-makhlubin, information regarding creation, like for example, al-qasas, like the stories in the Qur'an. So if you look at those three, Surah Al-Ikhlas would fall into the second category, information about Allah. And so therefore it is a third of the Qur'an from the point of view of the three parts of its subject matter. The other camp is the camp of Ibn Taymiyyah ta Ibn al-Qayyim's uh, teacher and before him the opinion of Imam Ibn Suraj. And this was mentioned by Ibn Taymiyyah if you mention al Fatawa that basically the Qur'an subject matter can be divided into three. Right? And he said the first one is Al-Ahkam rules and regulations. The second one is al-wa'ad wal-wa'id, promises of pleasure and threats of punishment. And number three, al-asma wa sifat names and attributes of Allah. And obviously, Surah Al-Ikhlas would fall into the third of these three categories. And still, in that sense, uh, according to the basic uh, opinion of this camp, would be one of the three main subjects to, uh, basically taken up by the Qur'an. Uh, but there is an important uh, thing to note that was mentioned by Ibn Aqil, ta'ala, and that is that he said, Ibn Aqil, he said, وَلَا يَجُوزُ أَنْ يَكُونَ الْمَعْنَى مَنْ قَرَعَهَا فَلَهُ أَجْرُ ثُلُثَ الْقُرْآنِ بِقَوْلِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ وَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَنْ قَرَعَ الْقُرْآنِ فَلَهُ بِكُلِّ حَرْفٍ عَشْرُ حَسَنَاتٍ So Ibn Aqil, basically what he says, he said, it's not possible or not um, acceptable to say that the meaning is that the one who recited Surah Al-Ikhlas, it would be as if he recited and he will get the reward of reciting a third of the Qur'an. And they say that this is, and he says that this is the case because of the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever recites the Qur'an, he will get for every letter ten rewards. Ten rewards for every letter he recites. And so basically Ibn Aqil, Ibn Aqil is saying, that the Prophet is teaching us in this hadith that the reward you get is equivalent to the number of huruf you recite. And that's that and if we accept the meaning that you recite Surah Al Ikhlas and get the reward as if you recited three uh, I'm sorry, a third of the Quran, it would contradict what the Prophet is saying in this hadith, which is basically that the reward we get is equivalent to the number of 
letters we recite. And so this person who recited significantly less will then get the same reward as the person who recited significantly more. And Ibn Aqil says that uh, particular interpretation is unacceptable. Not saying that that's not out there, but I'm saying that Ibn Aqil is, is assertive and unequivocal in his, in his belief that that is not an acceptable explanation of that hadith. Moving on, Sebab bin Nuzul. Uh, what was the precursor? What was the incident that prompted the revelation of the surah? There are three opinions from the scholars. The first one is that the polytheists, some of the mushrikun in Mecca, they came to the Prophet and said, In Siblana Rabbek. They said, O Muhammad, provide us with the lineage of your Lord. And that's because um, in their culture, because they were idol worshippers, that someone would craft an idol and then that idol would be inherited or passed down to someone else. And so there, so basically the lineage of the idol would be it was made by so-and-so who passed it down to so-and-so who passed it down to such-and-such and so on and so forth. And so in their mind, every god has what? A lineage, right? And so they were asking the Prophet for the lineage of his god and so Allah revealed Surah Al-Ikhlas. Tayyib, the second uh, opinion regarding Sabah Nuzul is that uh, Am, a man by the name of Amr ibn Tufayl he came to the Messenger of Allah and he said Ila ma, and so he said Ila ma tad'una. he said Ya Muhammad Ila ma tad'una. he said Oh Muhammad to what do you invite us you know what is it that you are calling us to so the Prophet responded Allah I'm sorry the Prophet responded or replied Ila Allahi Azza wa Jal I call you I invite you to Allah the Mighty the Majestic and so Amr he responded and said Sifhuli, describe him to me. Amin dhahabin huwa, min fidda, min hadid. He said, describe him to me, O Muhammad, because in his mind, our idols are made of what? They're made of something. They're made of some type of substance. So describe your God to me. Is he made of gold? Is he made from silver? Is he made from iron? So Allah revealed surat and ikhlas. Last but not least, from the opinions of the scholars regarding Sebab and Nizul, the precursor that led to the, uh, the incident which prompted the revelation of the surah, is that some rabbis, some Jewish rabbis came to the Prophet ﷺ and they assumed that he was calling to a polytheistic belief. That just like the other Arabs, he was calling to some what? Some, some form of polytheism. So they asked him, they said, Min ayyi jinsin huwa, your lord, from what species is he? Wamim Wamim man warith. And from I'm sorry, Wamim man warith dunya. And from whom did he inherit the earth? Waliman yuwarithuha. And who will inherit it from him? And who will what? Inherit it from him. Again, believing that what? Whatever you are calling to must be like the religions and the beliefs and the calls of these other Arab polytheist, and so Allah revealed Surat and Ikhlas. And the summary, basically, if you look at all of these different uh, opinions about the Sebab and Nuzul, all the different opinions, what do they have in common? Is that some people had some misconceptions about Allah, about the God of Muhammad, the God to whom he called and invited the people to worship and to enter into his religion. And they assumed that he, the God of Islam, was like their false deities. So Allah clarified the unique, unrivaled reality of Allah. Now, there's an important note before we actually get to the tafsir, there's something important to note about this surah. And that is that this surah, Surah Al-Ikhlas, which we said could be, uh, could be interpreted or translated as pristine purity, the chapter of pristine purity, is a chapter dedicated to a tawheed, singling out Allah and making him the sole recipient of that to which he is solely or he alone is entitled. Ifradullahi bi kulli ma yakhtassu bihi at This is what the surah is dedicated to. This is its primary message, its underlying and core meaning uh, that it wants to convey. Is the, the, the meaning of what a tawheed. Ifradullahi bi ma yakhtassu bihi bi kulli ma yakhtassu bihi. Singling out Allah and making him the sole recipient of that to which he alone is entitled. And this Tawheed can be divided into two branches. The first branch is Tawheed al-Itiqad wal marifah It is the Tawheed in theory. And that Tawheed in theory can be divided into two ways. It's basically usually divided into two categories. 
The first one is tohid, the tohid of Allah's actions. Singling out Allah in the things that He does. And that's typically referred to as tohid or rububiyah. The second type of tohid, under this category, this first category, so, okay, so the, the, the second subcategory, is the tohid of Allah's names and attributes. The names by which He is called, correctly referred, and the attributes with which he is correctly uh, and appropriately described. And that is known as Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat. And we said both of those come under the first category, Tawheed al-Itiqad wa Ma'rifa, the Tawheed in theory. The second Tawheed is Tawheed, Tawheed al-Qasd wa irada It is the Tawheed in practice. And that is based on Tawheed of the worship-related actions of Allah's servants, Tawheed al-Ibad, what they call Tawheed al-Ibad. So now this second category of Tawheed is the Tawheed where we single out Allah in the acts that we do. The acts that we do which are considered acts of worship. Allah should be the sole object of that Tawheed. Now when you look at, there was a surah that we did a few days back, Surah Al-Kafirun. When you look at this surah, and these two surahs, they're almost like, they're like sisters. Surah Al-Kafirun was Surah Al-Ikhlas. To the point that the Prophet ﷺ, in some of his rawatib, like the, the ratiba of Fajr, the two rak'ah before Salat al-Fajr, and the two rak'ah ba'd Salat al-Maghrib, and some of the other prayers, he typically would couple between these two surahs, al-Kafirun and Surat al-Ikhlas. They are like surahs. Why? And they are both considered a type of Surat al-Ikhlas, right? They're both like al-Ikhlas al-Awwal al-Ikhlas, I'm sorry, al-Ikhlas al-Awwal al-Ikhlas al-Thani, or Surat al-Ikhlas al-Ula, or Surat al-Ikhlas al-Thaniya. They're like the first surah of pristine purity, the second surah of pristine purity. Why? Because both of them are dedicated to one of these two categories of a tawheed. So surah al-kafirun is dedicated to what? The second one. The tawheed of al-irada wal-qasd. The tawheed of purifying our worship from the taint of a shirk. But this surah, the one that we're covering now, surah al-ikhlas, is dedicated to the first category. Purifying our beliefs and the way that we think of and imagine God from the taint of idolatrous beliefs and ideologies. That we make sure that basically ikhlas is concerned with what? The inside, the heart, and our mindset, what we believe about God, how we understand God, okay? The concept of God, what is that for the Muslim? How is that supposed to be? It purifies that concept. And the second one, Surah Al-Kafirun, purifies what? The outward actions, the things that we do Outwardly, the acts of worship we perform to make sure that the object of that worship, the sole object of that worship, and those deeds is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This makes this surah, Surah Al-Ikhlas, along with Al-Kafirun, extremely important for the Muslim to understand. Why? Because the foundation of the Islamic religion is what? A tawheed. And this foundation, if it is not solid, a person's Islam cannot stand. There can be no Islam, brothers and sisters, without a tawheed. And I know it, 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 some people, you hear, they hear the word tawheed and they, they, they turn off, they tune out. Tawheed, come on, everybody knows that. Do we really know it? And do we understand how important and critical this is to us being Muslim? That without a tawheed, there is no Islam. Allah says, لَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبَلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَتَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ it has been revealed to you, O Muhammad, as it was revealed to those before you, if you commit idolatry in belief or practice, if you don't really understand Al-Kafirun in terms of what? The practice of Tawheed, the practical aspect of Tawheed, and you don't understand Al-Ikhlas in terms of the, the theoretical, the concept of God form of Tawheed. If you don't have this, if you don't have this clearly in your heart and in your actions, your deeds will be rendered null and void, and you will be from the losers in the hereafter. So we have to know that these surahs are so important for us to understand ourselves and to teach to our kids to make sure our children understand the correct concept of God in theory and what that should translate to in terms of our deeds in practice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say He is Allah the one and only, single in the qualities of divinity absolutely unique without rival or peer of any kind, indivisible. Allah Samad, Allah the eternal refuge. He is the one upon whom all creatures, whether an animate, living, or inanimate, depend. 
and he is flawless and perfect in every way. The all-knowing whose knowledge encompasses all things without exception. He has, there is nothing which escapes his knowledge. His knowledge is perfect and complete and absolute, all-encompassing. The great, impeccable in his greatness. The independently wealthy, whose riches encompass everything in existence without exception. The all-wise, perfect in his wisdom, and so on. You name the quality. Allah has it completely, totally, without any nuqs, without any deficiency, or without any shortcoming or flaw. In other words, He possesses every quality of perfection in the most absolute and complete sense, and is free of any and every deficiency. This is the meaning of a samad. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ He neither begets nor was He begotten. And since He is unique, Totally unlike his creatures, since he is a summoned and perfectly independent, in no need of them while they are in total need of him, a summoned. He does not have offspring, nor is he the offspring of another. This is a great point of distinction, brothers and sisters, between us Muslims and the people of other faiths. This is one of the fawasid, this is one of the defining lines of distinction between us and the people of other faiths. The idolaters said that the angels are the daughters of Allah. Some of the Jews, particularly during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they used to say, Uzair ibn Allah. Uzair is the son of Allah. And the Christians to this day say and maintain that Jesus is the son of God. If, But what do the Muslims say? They say, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not have offspring, nor is he the offspring of anyone. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And there is none comparable to Him. Whatever we imagine, whatever we picture, whatever is present in creation or simply in our imagination is not Allah. He has no equivalent, not in His being, His names, or any of His attributes. And any likeness between Him and His creation is purely in, the, in name only, not in haqiqa, not in reality. So for example, you say, for example, um, um, you say, for example, هذا سميه. This person, he, he, he hears. وهذا بصير. This person, he sees. And Allah says about himself that he is سميعٌ بصير. He says that he is seeing and hearing. Yes, but the likeness between this person seeing and Allah seeing is what? It's like night and day. Yes, Allah sees and this person sees and some of his other creatures see. But they don't see the way Allah sees. Allah seeing is perfect. Allah sees all things. Whereas his creatures do not see all things. Their sight is what? It's limited. Allah hears all things. Whereas creatures, they hear some things and their hearing is what? Is limited. Which is why Allah says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There is nothing like unto him. There's no semblance for him. وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ but he is the all hearing, I'm sorry, the all seeing, I'm sorry, the all hearing, the all seeing. So yes, he sees and hears, and some of his creatures see and hear, but there is a significant difference, difference between his seeing and their seeing, his hearing and their hearing. There is no what? No comparison between the two. The only likeness between the two is in name, not in what? Not in reality. Lessons. What can we learn, brothers and sisters, from what we heard today? from the tafsir of Surat Al-Ikhlas. First of all, we learned about the virtue of the Surah, that this Surah is equivalent to a third of the Qur'an. Another thing that we learned is that the meaning of this virtue, what does it mean? And we said that it's related to the subject matter, as was mentioned by Ibn Al-Qayyim and Ibn Taymiyyah, although they differed about the specifics of that, they both agreed that the meaning is related to what? The subject matter, the Qur'an subject matter is divided into three categories, and the uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas is related to one of those three what? categories of subject matter. Number three from the lessons is that the purpose of the Surah is to clarify misconceptions about Allah's being, His names, and His attributes, and to teach mankind the correct way to believe in and perceive Him, the correct concept of Allah in Islam, the concept of God in Islam. Number four, it is very important for every Muslim to understand and live by the two surahs, Al-Kafirun and Al-Ikhlas, because they summarize the two forms of a Tawheed, which is the foundation of our religion. We talked about that, how without this foundation, there can be no Islam. 
Number five from the lessons, the major difference between our religion and the religion of other people, or every other faith, is our commitment to the strictest form of monotheism. That is what makes us different. That is why this is so important. That is why we as Muslims cannot belittle the importance of a Tawheed, because that is what distinguishes us from the other faiths. And you have to understand the Shaitan is keen to blur the lines of distinction between our religion and the false religions. And so he comes after a Tawheed and weakens our attachment to Tawheed, weakens the level of importance we assign to a Tawheed. And we have to not fall for this trick of the Shaitan, fall into this trap. We have to be the people who are keen to learn what is Tawheed and to practice a Tawheed, realizing that these two sorters embody what? Embody Tawheed in theory, al-Ikhlas, and Tawheed in practice, Surat al-Kafirun. Number six from the lessons, the true Islamic monotheism is achieved when we do four things. Achieve when you do four things. First thing, affirm every quality of perfection to Allah. Every quality of perfection, we attribute it to who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, we negate every deficiency from Allah. Everything that can be considered a, a, a deprecant or a deprecation, we deny or negate that from Allah. Number three, negate the existence of any comparison or someone or something that resembles Allah. And number four, negate any partner or associate with Allah of any kind. And guess what, brothers and sisters? All of these four pillars of true monotheism are found in Surat Al-Ikhlas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who understand it, who embody it, and who teach it to our children, our offspring, so they also understand it and embody it as well. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in closing to bless your houses, to bless your spouses, to bless your wives, to bless your children, to bless uh, you, to bless the remaining of your day, and to make you bless wherever you may be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it from those who he teaches beneficial knowledge and who he truly benefits through that knowledge by making us from those who truly put it into practice. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته